Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Alex Chisholm. Thank you so much for attending this data query webinar where we're gonna discuss what should I learn, R or Python? Really one of the big questions of, of the day. Um, I'm the co-founder of Data Query. We host more than 2000 data science learning opportunities and resources on, online. Um, and we also run corporate data trainings and teach uh, throughout the world in a variety of venues, data science um, and programming. I'm very happy today to be joined by my colleague and co-founder, David. Uh, David, you wanna say a quick word? Yes, thanks, Alex. So hi, everyone, my name is David. I've been a data scientist here in the Washington DC metro area for over 10 years. I'm also an adjunct professor at George Mason University where I teach uh, courses in machine learning and uh, database systems. And it's great to be here. I'm, I'm excited to talk about machine learning uh, and, and the, the strength of Python and R. Uh, so hopefully you guys are excited as well. And it's really a, it's a hot topic, this choice of R versus Python. And we are here as lovers of both Python and R. Uh, we're, so we're not, we're not going to take a sensationalist approach. There's not one right tool for every situation, uh, but there's certainly very different tools. Um, and depending on what you're working on and what environments, you know, one might be more appropriate than the other. So we have people that have registered from more than 10 countries uh, around the world, which is fantastic. We're going to make the slides available. We're going to make the code available from anything that we talk through tonight. Um, if you've got any questions along the way, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A box and we will take them in, in stride. This is a, an informal uh, conversation where we don't really have slides per se, uh, but we're gonna pull up a few ideas we wanna talk through and then just we're gonna bring open um, some of these tools and start doing some live coding uh, to show you, show you some of the differences. So with that, let me share my screen. And we've got a skeleton outline of what we want to discuss. And we're going to go through and talk holistically about you know, what programming uh, means today, what data science is, how you can get involved, uh, before going through a bunch of components to look at these differences between the tools in greater detail. So let's start right away with just you know, why data science. And you can take the, the cynical career-driven approach or you can take the kind of exciting, I can kind of control what I want to do um, and work on interesting projects approach. But either way, data science is a fascinating field to be in right now. Um, when you look at all of the numbers about job growth um, and, and changes over time and expectations for job growth in the future, shortage of data skills, especially data science skills, it is a place that organizations need today. And with you know, the right training, Thankfully, there's plenty of it online, mostly for free, you can do on your own. You know, there, there are ample ways to get involved. We also have um, a lot of diverse career paths. So you know, David is a machine learning data scientist, really, at this point. You know, um, and you can be a data analyst or a business analyst. Um, you can be a data architect or a database engineer. You know, there's so many things that you can get involved with with this core skill set that even if you hop in and you, you go on one of these tracks and you wanna start hopping around into other areas, um, you're gonna have the ability to do that because organizations are hiring kind of in each one of these career paths. David, do you wanna give a quick background on sort of just how you developed your, your data science machine learning skills, especially at a time where it wasn't as formalized, which it is now finally starting to become? Yes, yeah, the one great thing that has happened um, in the last 10 years is that the different roles in data science have become more clear and now companies are hiring for those specific roles. And so when I got into the field, everyone just referred to it as uh, data science, data scientist. And then one person was typically hired and you had to do all aspects of a data project. So that was a you know, blessing and a curse at the same time because it really forced me to uh, do all the steps uh, to deliver a data product. I like to call them data products because uh, you're usually delivering not a machine learning model to people, but you're delivering a dashboard or some way to interact uh, with your model. So it's really best set as a product you're delivering to the business or maybe to people on your website. Um, but that's been the great part in data science is this diverse uh, career paths. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity. So, and just briefly what those are, 
you know, you have your data analysts, which take in raw data and look for insights and maybe develop uh, things that are known as KPIs in business. So these are statistics that, that the business tracks to see how well they're doing. Uh, then you have data scientists, which, you know, these days means people that are developing machine learning models. And then you also have machine learning engineers. So these are people that take the work from data scientists and actually put that into a production system so that it can scale out live on a website. So you can deliver uh, predictions almost in real time. And then data engineers, um, I always like to say, if I ever meet a data engineer, I want to offer to buy them coffee because they do, they're the backbone of data science. So these are the people that are, uh, they're preparing the data, they're extracting it from maybe third party sources in a business and combining it in a logical way and making quality data available to data scientists and end users. And it's not really, at least in machine learning and data science, it's not about the fancy algorithm that usually wins in the end. It's about having good, clean, quality data. Uh, that's what is a determining factor and whether you can build a, a really good uh, data product uh, or not. So yeah, it's been, it's been wild, wild 10 years. How much of your time do you think is spent cleaning data in your current job? It is still um, about 80% 80, 80 or so. But that's a, I define that much more broadly. Uh, it's a cleaning data. So for me, I consider cleaning data actually sitting down with the business end users and figuring out what pieces of the data I need to stitch together that will help build a great predictive model for their needs. So I consider that part of the, the cleaning because you still have to figure out what does the business need and how do I prepare that for them. And then typically the modeling stage, I always tell even my students, that's the almost the easy part. That's That's kind of been automated for the most part, especially in Python. There's so many, if you've ever heard the term auto ML before. So in Python, there's a lot of packages that you can apply multiple machine learning models just with maybe two lines of code to a data set and it yeah. will do all those results. So it's really data engineering is what will make people stand out, having that skill, being able to work with data, clean it and prepare it for people. It's very important. Yeah, I, I think Programming is not really a prerequisite for all data science roles today, but increasingly it's a way for people to stand out regardless of which one of those career paths that they might have started to go down in the data realm. Um, and I know that going from, so from my personal experience back in 2008, before like Tableau was really around or Power BI was any good, we had data, we wanted people to see it in fun ways. But there wasn't, aside from like sending someone an Excel document or an Excel workbook, it was hard to really give it to them in a way that was interactive. So we started getting involved with building dashboards um, and it was action script and flash based uh, dashboards, you know, at, at the time, which was really, you know, it was rudimentary when I look back now at, at what we were doing, but the core components, some of the ones we'll look at today are really the same, no matter what language you're programming in at any moment. And once you wrap your head around some of these fundamentals, you know, taking off pro with programming is a lot easier. And there's so many benefits to it. Um, the flexibility in terms of you actually being able to run the analysis or do the task you want to achieve. Oftentimes it's going to speed up your ability to make those insights, uh, to build systems, to process data. Um, the, one of the largest ones that always comes to mind is the ability of, of reproducibility. So when you go into Excel, and my guess is a lot of people on the call right now, you know, you're kind of at that Excel expert level and you wanna know what else you can do. And you think through your Excel work process and typically it involves you opening a worksheet, going to a random cell because you think something should be done around there. And then maybe jumping to a different tab and bringing it in with the V lookup. And it, very rarely do people you know, uh, record each one of their steps and make this a, 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 a sequential thing that other people then can go in and tweak. So there's all this, this uncertainty there. And what's great about programming is just by its very definition of running code top to bottom, you're gonna be able to see stepwise what it is you're doing at each step. And if something goes wrong, it doesn't really matter because you can just start back on that first step and, and go down again. Um, so data, David, you and I were talking this morning about you know the the ability or really programming becoming 
this this underpinning thing that while not required for everything is giving the giving people the chance to to stand out and in some roles you know you need to be an expert at this to to compete yeah how do you feel about that yeah all of the data analysts that i've worked with in the past have been very excited about learning r or python because a lot of these tools that are becoming popular now like power bi or tableau they have built-in connectors uh, to R and Python. So if there's something that the, the tool cannot achieve with its own functions or built-in functionality, you can write a special program within it to accomplish that task. And so it, it really will give you the ability to stand out as a data analyst. And, and that's the great thing about programming. It just, it takes you there. Yeah, and when we look around, last year we went out to you know, five, 6,000 different job descriptions um, from around the world. And we broke it down by, you know, some of the core ones. And here are just three, three examples, but we have a data analyst, data scientist, and data engineer. And we went through all the text from all of these job posts. And we said, how often is something like SQL mentioned or Excel or Python or R? Um, and we can see, you know, on, on all of the lists, you see kind of Python um, are, is there, but really Python and R for data analysts and data scientists what we typically see is Python is more likely to be recommended or more companies seem to be asking for that skill set. But you also have a lot more Python programmers in the world. So if you're finding that organization that has that, that R um, requirement or skill set you know, listed, uh, your, your odds are actually probably moving through or probably higher because they're not as many yes. kind of R trained data scientists these days. And our point once again is when you pick up one of these, you will either, because you are curious and you want to, you're going to hop into the other one and that you're going to find that there's a lot to be transferred between the two that's going to speed up your learning curve. So I started with R um, and then adding Python was you know, relatively simple. You have to learn the syntax and things change, um, but, but it's easier to make that jump. So it's more about that, that underlying skill set. And then really, I think the only clear cut answer, should I learn R or Python, is if you're really on that data engineering side, you know, you're going to be working um, in web development, like we'll talk about in a little bit, or software engineering, um, or doing all of those, the, those database connections. Well, it can all be done in R in some way. You know, Python sort of does stand alone over there, at least in terms of adoption um, from skill sets. Is that right, David? Yes, and I'm also noticing in the industry, there's a little bit of a shift uh, towards Python, just because Python can work with engineers and software developers and data scientists, you could all have the same tools. Uh, so that just makes it easier for companies rather than having to manage, you know, multiple languages at the same time. Yeah. Um, but either one is great. And it, it also depends on uh, industry. So we were talking this morning as well about there, there, there are certain industries where R stands out. So anywhere where you're doing a lot of statistical analysis or research or anything like that. So maybe in healthcare, if you're working at the CDC, if you're working at the FDA, they're, they're fans of R, you know, R and, um, and SAS, if you've ever heard of that. Those are the big languages there. So it just really depends on your yeah. future career goals and where you want to work. It's important to, to look at that first. Yeah. Or if you happen to be in higher education, R, which I think came yeah. out of more academic environments, um, is definitely more prevalent on, on, on college campuses and, and for researchers, that especially out, in and outside of data science as a specific field. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Enough talk. We've we've sort of we've we've set the stage for why you might be doing this, um, and whether you are new to either tool or you want to jump from one to the other. We're just going to talk through some of the the core. I don't want to say challenges, but some from some of the core actions you're going to be doing with either tool. And then we're going to show examples of, of it getting it done in both tools, because like we've said, and we're going to continue to say, you're going to be able to accomplish a lot of the same things in both tools. Uh, the question is where you're going to be applying these skills. And I think one of the most frustrating parts of setting up and getting into programming is actually getting your computer to be able to run the new tool, the new shiny tool it is you want to experiment. So whether this is downloading something to your desktop, um, installing it and getting it up and running, and even connecting to that first data file and, and setting the, the, the path directory in the right way to bring in that CSV file you want to start analyzing. 
um, or whether it's bringing in a library and adding some of the great packages that we're going to talk about a little bit later today. You know, this, this actually does matter. Um, and oh, let's just start on the R side of this. R has the more simple path to getting involved and starting to code. If you want to download it on your desktop, really all you need to do, and, and the, nearly everybody that's working with R will have done this at some point. Let me see if I can grab a, a link here. Yeah. No, you're going to go to R Studio, which is the, the predominant sort of software tool that, that, that brings in R capabilities. And you're gonna to have to do just two things. You're going to download the underlying statistical software, which is R, so you can download that. You're going to download R Studio Desktop. You're going to say yes to all of the presets, and you're going to be able to open it on your desktop and start do, and start working with it very very quickly. Um, there are there there's st you're still going to run into some of the issues of I need to find the right data or I need to import the right packages that I might not know about, um, but you're going to get up and running pretty quickly. So that's the desktop approach. We also have increasingly cloud opportunities um, to to use you know R Studio from your browser or Python from DeepNote um, uh, in, in your browser. We're going to be using those today as we're showing off some of these capabilities. Um, but on the R side, things are definitely a little bit more clear cut from the beginning, just because there seem to be fewer options, uh, but in, in a positive way. You've got this company, R Studio, which has done an amazing job of building an ecosystem around R. Full disclosure, David and I are, are certified R Studio trainers. Um, but it's, it's also just, it, it's true. Once you're, once you're into this tool, there's so many options for you to get up and running kind of quickly. David, do you want to talk on the Python side, especially around the, the desktop setup? Yes. Uh, so the common desktop setup is known as Anaconda. So it's a distribution of, of Python and all of the associated tools that you typically need for a Python project. So these include things like Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. Uh, so these are notebook based environments where you can write text within your code and then have code blocks that you can execute and view the output. It's a great way to document uh, your process. So it's the, the steps are similar. You have to click download and it takes a bit longer. I noticed than our studio. It takes about five times as long and a bit more memory because you're downloading a lot of stuff uh, to your computer. Uh, but the it's a bit more challenging to set up your, what's known as a Python environment. So these are the maybe external packages that you want to use for a project. So those, you have to be comfortable with things like the terminal on your computer. Um, and so this could be challenging for Windows users because the terminal isn't something that you use uh, day to day. I found that people with Macs usually do a little bit better in their terminal, but that can be very frustrating. Uh, for beginners. To, to for the people that are on the call that don't even know what a terminal is, can you can you describe it? <laughs> uh, so that is uh, a way to uh, tell your computer how to open a file, for example, without actually navigating to it or clicking onto it. So yeah. it's kind of a sub language for your operating system on your computer, and <laughs> and that's really how all these things are downloaded behind the scenes. And if you and don't know, it looks like. you, you may have yeah. accidentally opened it before and said, oh my goodness, I'm about to break my computer. <laughs> and then you, you, you kind of walk away and then you, you close it out. But yeah, you're going yes. to, especially with Python, you know, your opportunities and chances to interact with this terminal um, are going to be something you're going to, to have to do at some point, um, which is why yes. I, I, at first it's just a little bit more, uh, I think, confusing potentially. It is, and they've gotten a lot better. Anaconda has gotten much better and it made it easier to set things up, but it is a bit more of a challenge, but it's a great, great product. And recently there have been, it seems like almost an explosion of these notebook-based environments in the cloud. And this is what I recommend uh, to all my students because there's really no setup required at all. So Alex just opened up uh, this product named DeepNote and you just can start a project. You can pick which version of Python you would like, right? So maybe 3.9, and it will spin up, uh, spin up that computer for you. And then you can go ahead and start coding. And you don't have to worry about installing any uh, dependencies or packages or setting anything up. And, and the nice thing about most of these platforms is all of the typical packages you need for data science are already pre-installed. 
So you just open it up and you code. And the same thing goes for a product named Data Lore. Uh, that's from a company named JetBrains, also a great product. And then Google Collaboratory. So they all kind of look the same. So you always have these uh, code cells where you can execute code. You have markdown cells where you can write paragraphs and document. And, and the best part of all for all these is all of them have a free tier. So DeepNode actually offers 750 hours a month where you can just be in there coding and going wild. So it's just an excellent way to get in, because especially when you're starting out in data science, you don't want to be bogged down with the software engineering aspect of setting up something on your computer. Um, it's just better to just go ahead and learn these things and things will come more naturally as you get better or more comfortable in the yeah. environment. And the other consideration is when eventually you start working with really large data sets, you know, the cloud variation might be the only one that is going to work for you because your local machine might not be able to handle it. And we actually have a question that came in from Michelle asking, you know, how much memory or RAM should a, a Python or R newbie really expect to have or need on their local desktop for some of those desktop, desktop options? Yeah, for most data sets out there and projects, if you have eight gigabytes of RAM on your desktop, you're okay. Uh, for the most part. But if you want to get into a sub branch of machine learning, it's known as deep learning, where you're working with uh, images, for example, you're classifying images or video or audio, that's when things get, uh, that's where you can get in trouble. You really need a lot more RAM. And even then, I don't have enough on my desktop, and I have 32 gigabytes of RAM, and that's not enough. Uh, so at that point, you are forced to go into a cloud based environment where Google Collaboratory, that's, I think, the best one for big data because their free tier includes uh, things known as GPUs, and it really speeds up working with big data. You can, you can work on pretty massive data sets for free, and then it's only $10 a month after that, and it can handle some pretty big data. So yeah, there's lots of options uh, for that. Yeah. yeah. All right, we've got our, our, our unit set up. You can go the desktop route, you can go the cloud version. Um, oh, we, we didn't declare a winner. So you can see on the, on the bottom right-hand side, we sort of picked which one we think wins this battle between Python and R. Uh, a lot of these are gonna be kind of close and they change over time as more options come up. Um, but for the pure simplicity of getting in and getting started, um, I think R probably still wins this, um, maybe because of the limited path to getting up and running. Uh, but I, I'd give the R the edge to R here. A little bit, yeah. And it also yeah. depends on things like data set size. If, if that's the case, if you're working with big data, then Python would be more of the winner because yeah. it would be forced into the cloud. So it really depends, but I agree. Yeah, R Studio, easy to set up, great product. Yeah. All right, the second thing we wanted to take a look at was just the basics of programming. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, once you get these fundamentals, under your belt, being able to hop into a new programming language becomes much, much easier. And we all recognize that, you know, probably in 30 years, it's not going to be Python or R, it'll be something else. But a lot of the underlying logic is going to remain largely the same, I think. <laughs> um, that's probably a terrible thing to say. 30 years from now, David's going to say, remember when you said nothing is going to change? And then, you know, yeah, it's sure enough, fun. sure enough, it will. Um, but, but we have these major, um, Topics we have we have variables. So this is like setting something and saying I want the computer to think of this when I type in this. So we're going to assign somebody's name, like David, um, is, is equal to name. Um, so we have all these things. We're going to have like assign single things. We and then we can put these things together in a, in a list or in a, an array. You can start thinking of like in Excel when you've got. Uh, one header and you've got a bunch of different values going down um, a column. Um, we, we will talk about things like for loops where we're going through that list and saying for each one of these things, do something. And then there are if statements, which if you know Excel well, you probably have done this in Excel many times. If this equals something, then do something else. And then finally functions. And this is where, yes, you can within Excel building up macros, uh, but within R and Python, either making your own function 
like we, we've done very briefly on the bottom here with a very simple function, but more realistically, taking the amazing set of predefined functions that are available um, through some of the, the leading packages uh, that we'll look at uh, in a few moments from now, uh, you're going to be able to call these on your own. So instead of you writing everything you need to do to build that scatter plot, you're going to be able to say, hey, ggplot, here's some data, here are the variables I want, make a scatter plot for me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then do, do it for every single one of these 210 countries. Right. Yeah, yeah. going back the to power. the speed, the speed and flexibility. Um, so we won't we won't do uh, I won't go through a bunch of this. We're gonna, like I said, share this code with you. We'll send out an email so you can go through and, and, and do it yourself once you're set up in the the environment of your choosing. But you can see here, here's our cloud version of Python, and here's the variable assignment example that that I was just talking through. And it looks like we're ready to go here. So if I if I were to run this. Python was just told, we're going to assign the value David to the variable name. The age of 39, which is a, two, we're jumping the gun here. I think David's only 38. We talked about this this morning. Sorry, sorry, David, not to, to fix this. <laughs> uh, but you can see David, that age is 39, two kids married is true for a true or false, right? And then we told Python to print this stuff out and just show it back to us. So it, it, it told us what the value of age was from the computer's point of view, which is 39. And then we asked what type it was. And it turns out it's an integer. This, this stuff does become important, uh, knowing like if it's an integer value or a float value or a string, all, all of these things you're gonna hear as you get further into, into your plan. But for now, we don't really need to think too much about it. Um, and the on the flip side of this, let me just turn on my, my R instance right now so I can get back into it. I could take this list of information. I could run some stuff. Now I'm putting in those four variables that we created and I'm saying, show me what's in that list. So Python's been able to go through and now, and now it has a list that has all of these different items in it. For a for loop, I'm gonna say for each one of those four items, show me each one individually. And now you can see it's spitting out David 39, two, true. And you can start thinking of, well, if I had a really, really long list and I wanted to do different things to different types within my list, I could go through a for loop like this and say, you know, do this really, 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 really quickly. And then to, to finish this off, because the logic is the exact same, I'll go into Studio Cloud now, which should be open. And this is our first look at, at, at the R console. And this is what R Studio will look like almost identically uh, as the one that you would download on your desktop. And that's one reason I kind of like our in our studio. Um, the, the it, it looks very similar. I I I was running. I, I worked on Python all day today, um, and I did it in a program called VS Code, and it looks nothing like that deep, <laughs> uh, deep no, yeah. notebook that we're going through right now. Um, but but this this does, and you can either you can either build and and you will when you're making your instructions in your code, you're going to use script files, and in R it's going to be dot R. In Python, it's going to be .py. And for a lot that you're going to be able to do, you're going to assign variables like this. right? Here are the same four variables we assigned earlier. I'm going to run this. And in the bottom down in the console, you can see that it was ran. It ran. And now over my far right-hand side, you see that the computer now knows I've got these values associated with these variables. right? So by, by running this, everything got pulled together. And now you can continue to do, uh, you can do work from this. So if I typed age down in the console, you can see 39 comes up. So if I typed in age plus five, it knows to go out and get that numeric value, add five here and get, and get 44. It, it'll happen to you <laughs> if you're lucky. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wanted to show you this script because this is how most, I would say, a lot of work still gets done. People are building scripts on their own. It's, it's, it's easier you go through, you can run them again and again. But R also has this, this kind of Jupyter notebook feel to do, to do sort of more interactive coding. And in this one, let's see what we've done. So I've got, uh, we've assigned our variables. We've run the for loops. I'll run them again just to make, just to make sure. I've got a list now. 
And I can go through and say, with this for loop, for each item in my life, I'm going to print the item out. And you can see we get the same, uh, the same four values. So this is, this is like the basics of, of, of coding. And it's going to be the type of functions that are behind all the really advanced um, formulas and functions you're going to be able to access on your own. So it's good to, to pick up these at some point. When we look at comparing these two, David, which one, which one do you think are more easy to pick up from a, from a new learner point of view? I think the syntax is much easier in Python. Uh, for beginners, uh, it just has more clean feel to it. It flows logically. And one thing I do like about Python is that it forces indentation for it to work correctly. So if you define a for loop, the print item, for example, in that second line has to be a tab over uh, for it to be correct syntax. So it almost forces you to neatly organize your code and it's easy to read. Uh, whereas R doesn't have those type of rules. It's a bit more free as long as you put uh, within curly uh, braces, you know, the code in your for loop, there's no requirements for spacing or how the code looks. So it can be difficult for beginners to, to understand that. Um, and, and you might see also with R, they don't in pure R use an equal sign to define things. You're using this less than sign, uh, negative sign. <laughs> To, to assign, and it shows directional assignment of, of, of values. In reality, 99% of your use cases can be done still using the equal sign. For many years, I, I, I did that as well, and I, I finally sort of uh, pivoted over. So that, that's one difference you see right away. Uh, the other one is you see a lot more of these brackets, right? So on this for loop, uh, we have to put parentheses around item in my life and then some brackets. When compared to Python, it's just the loop, no parentheses, a colon, and then print the item. Um, and when you get into something like a function where you're gonna have kind of nested and if else statements, you see a lot of these brackets. And you can see it starts getting a little bit more challenging uh, to, to read. In the long run, like any syntax, you'll be fine. You'll pick it up, you'll know what to do. Uh, but, but right off the bat, I think from a beginner's point of view, I agree with you, David, that we probably give Python the edge here, uh, at least in terms of the base uh, common um, basics for, for each program. Definitely. Now let's talk about what can really accelerate what you can do with these tools. The amount of people, data scientists, engineers, have come up with probably every problem you can imagine, right? Someone else has thought through it. Someone else has dealt with it. And there are these amazing open source libraries of people who are saying, yeah, we know this is a common problem, or maybe not even common. That's how big the communities are. We know that this is a problem. We're going to provide you with a library to take care of a lot of this really complex uh, work to speed up a lot of your, your analysis um, and your data science work. On the R side, um, CRAN is, is the organization that hosts a lot of these, these packages. Sometimes you'll hear packages and libraries used uh, interchangeably but you can go there through our studio or through the, the tool you're gonna to be using to code. And you can say, hey, I've heard about this really great um, package that, uh, maybe called Tidyverse. Um, I wanna get me some of that. <laughs> so you're gonna go yeah. out, you're going to be able to bring it in through your script in R. We're gonna install it just one time and then I'm gonna be able to call it. And then once you've brought this in, there are all these predefined functions, I guess in some ways similar to, to Excel, that you can just call uh, with the data that's in front of you. And that's how it's done on the R side. Python is fairly similar, right, David? Yes, yeah, there's, there's PyPy, which is the, you know, the common repository for the third-party packages. Uh, there's also something that's uh, called Conda. So that's associated with the Anaconda distribution. They also manage uh, package and, and dependencies uh, for Python users as well, but it's a very rich uh, ecosystem. And one thing I wanted to mention is that there's been a kind of a shift to open source in the last couple of years. So things that were proprietary before. So I think the profit uh, forecasting package at Facebook, we had something known as Flight, which was developed by Uber. Uh, to work on data engineering and things. So all these things are becoming open sourced and you can find all these amazing functions 
in at these package uh, repositories and then use them in your own programs and, and build your own apps with them. So it's, it's pretty incredible. And, and the common libraries for data science in Python, uh, so Pandas is, is a huge one. Um, if, if you Google Python, that's, that's going to come up right away. And there's also something known as uh, Scikit-Learn, which is for machine learning. That's been around for a very long time, huge community there. And pretty much any machine learning algorithm or application you can think of, it's been written efficiently uh, with Scikit-Learn works very well. Yeah. And if you go visit some of these links, when you get the slides, you'll see here, you know, this is just like an alphabetical list of the additional packages you could load into R. Um, so it's a it's a huge page. I could probably type in regression. Let me get one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm still in the A's, just typing in regression for the amount that you could bring in. Yeah. Um, for either one of these tools, we'll talk a little bit about Stack Overflow later. But you're, you, I, I still. How, how many times, Dave, did you go into Stack Overflow today? Uh, I think it was three times today. Yeah. And as I was, yeah, writing an application. I just needed to figure something out. That's such a great resource because most people have solved the problems you have already, maybe yeah. in a different language, but they, they've solved it. So it's, it's amazing. And if you don't know Stack Overflow, you just you essentially go to Google and you say something like Python convert list to data frame. Mm -hmm. And oh, someone beat it here. That's, that's amazing. They, they, they probably get a lot of volume. <laughs> this top site, uh, but you can see Stack Overflow here at number at number two. There are a lot of different resources. People have been asking this question in many different ways over time. Uh, I usually go to the one that has the most recent date uh, that that tends to work best for for me. And you'll see, hey, I've got this list. I want to turn this into a data frame, and then people are going through and they're telling you, you know, how they would solve it. So a lot of the, the, the joke is if you took like copy and paste away from programmers, they'd be really stuck uh, for, yep. for getting their work done. And it's super true. But both of these tools have very large communities. Um, I'll show you later, but I think it's their 2 million posts on Python. Um, there might only be 500,000 on R, but R's are going to be more specific. You're going to have a greater share of those are going to be in data science, while Python has more kind of applicability. Uh, so they're, they're probably not too far apart. Yeah. Now let's get into some fun stuff with, with data manipulation. And here, I mentioned on the previous uh, slide, the tidyverse on R. Within this tidyverse are actually several different packages. One of them is called dplyr. And dplyr is probably the most equivalent thing to pandas um, within the, the world of, of Python. And these are the two leading modules to help you sort of do more with data more quickly. Um, so why don't, why don't we just jump into to Python here. So here's our cloud version of Python again. And maybe David, I'll, I can run this, to, or you can run it since it's since you're up here right now and you can talk through it too. Great, let me run it. And, uh, and what do you do? Great... <laughs> so here I am uh, importing pandas as, uh, and I'm adding an alias pd. So that's the, uh, the typical way you import pandas. So now Python will know that anytime I type pd, I am interested in the, the pandas package and all the, the functions available in it. And so here I'm loading a data set that has auto claims. And let me play the next code chunk just to show you what you have here in this data set. So each row is a customer and they have submitted a claim at a car insurance company. So they had an accident and they submitted, I, I, I broke my car and I need this uh, much money uh, to fix it. So we have all sorts of demographics on these people and how much they pay in their premiums and uh, total claim amount, how much it's going to cost to fix things. But the great thing about DeepNote is if you read in a data frame through Pandas, so I use the read underscore CSV function uh, to load this in, it's just uh, you get a lot of great summaries right off the bat in, in the header. So if you have a text or categorical column, it's going to count all the distinct values, give you a percentage. Uh, if you have a numeric uh, column, it's going to show you the distribution of those values and a nice histogram there. So there's a lot of built-in analysis that's already been done for you uh, just by loading um, a data frame. 
And if you want to get more of these specifics, there's this method, it's known as info. And typically these are called by, you have to put a period after the object that you want to apply that method to, and then you apply the method. So here it's info. And what this will do is it will tell you all the details about your data frame. So it tells you how many rows you have at the top. So 6,249, so that's how many rows. It shows you all of the columns. And more importantly is the data type. So that's in the D type column there on the right. So object is Pandas' way of uh, coding strings or categorical data. And then you have things like int 64, which are integers, and then float 64. So these are decimal numbers. So that's a great method. And just a high level, Alex and I wanted to show you just the common tasks that you'll be doing if you work with pandas. So a lot of the times you're going to be creating new columns uh, from existing columns in your data set. And there's a great method. It's known as assign. And this allows you to create one or more uh, new columns. And the, and the syntax is generally, um, I have a new column name. So that's what I want to call it. And I'm going to set that equal to some sort of expression or function call that uses the information in your data frame uh, to admit to manipulate it somehow and do something. And so you can see here, what I've done is on the third line after the dot assign, I'm creating a new column there called large underscore claim. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the total claim amount in the data. And for each amount, I'm checking is it greater than or equal to $1,500. So that's going to return either a true or a false. That's known as a Boolean in Python. And then after that is created, I'm using the map method on the, on the results. And I'm mapping the value true to the string yes, and then false to no. So that's how I can easily create this kind of yes, no indicator for a large claim. And I did the same thing for college underscore grad. I looked at people's highest education. And then I use the dot is in method. So it checks if somebody um, has high school or um, associate. And then that's going to map the falses to yet. So that means they either have a bachelor or a graduate degree and the true uh, to know. So let me go ahead and execute this chunk. So I'm going to hit play. And so now I have updated my auto claims. And then I can select these new columns to have a look. And so the way you do this is you do auto claims, you do two brackets there, and you select the columns you're interested in. And now we can see. All right, so it did things correctly. Now I've created those two new columns, large claim, college grad. And since I've done a lot of data engineering work in my career, I never just code things and assume it's going to be correct. I always double check, just make sure uh, that things are correct. That's an important part yeah. of data analysis. And this last bit of code you wrote is probably the first time that people are like, okay, this is getting a little bit complex. You're talking about mapping things. You've got true falses and squiggly brackets. And this is where, you know, going through the learning resources online, finding tutorials, it's just a matter of, of rote memory. You do it again and again. At some point you stop going to Stack Overflow every day and finding it because it's, it's stuck in your brain. Um, yep. But you always can find it there as well. David, why don't I finish this example in R to show, to show sort of the corollary? Yes, absolutely. So if I go into R now, and let me just scoot ahead here to the data manipulation section, we're going to do the exact same task. I'm mm -hmm. going to go out first. I'm going to go and get this, this data. And you can see okay. it's red, so it's thinking. And now I have this auto claim data. What again, I like about R in this case is I can click on this and kind of look at the data frame as if it were an Excel uh, spreadsheet. Um, I can view it here, just like you were seeing in, in, in the, the deep note. It's a little bit less fancy. You don't have summary statistics on the top. You don't have visuals, but there are other ways you could pull that up in, in this as well. Here's what David did from the, the creating new variables. And here I think is a good point where I think Data manipulation, at least with Python, with R right now, is still a little bit more clear in terms of the language around what you're doing. So you can see here, I'm saying, take my auto claims, make it equal to the, the data set I loaded in, so the, the original auto claims. 
Then I'm going to mutate, which means create something new. I want that large claim new variable. Then I'm just going to make an if else statement. So if that claim is greater than or equal to, yes. If not, no. Um, so I think it flows a little bit better. And one thing from dplyr you'll, you'll get to know if you go in the R route is this, this chain method or this, this pipe it's called within dplyr, which essentially says, grab something, do something, do something else. And it's again and again and again. And it simplifies some of that logic to where when I run this, and I, and I run the whole thing again, and I bring out the data points, same exact data that David was able to get in Python. But when I'm getting it, instead of like double brackets and parentheses and, and you bring them in, I'm saying, you know, go out to my data frame and just select those variables. So I think there's it's a little bit more human language at, at this stage. Yeah, very intuitive. And the last thing we'll show is just obviously everything you could you'd imagine. You know, I can go through pretty quickly and just say, hey, get my data, count the highest education, and see the output. I can go out and 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 get frequency counts for two variables, so I know know a state where they are within the state, the number of, of responses. Um, and, and then to finish up the data manipulation section, you can start doing interesting things like saying, give me only the numeric data and give me the numeric summary for these. And one question we always get from people that are making the switch is, well, pivot tables are great in Excel. You, know, you can do the same type of thing um, in a variety of ways in, in Python and R. Mm -hmm. um, but, what I, but I hope you can see from the examples both in Python and R here is just how with relatively little amount of code, you can do some pretty big changes to your data set. And once you get the code right, the risk of messing up in a way that you, you could in Excel is a lot lower, I think. Yes, yeah. So unless David's gonna fight me here, I'm going to say R for the beginner probably wins on data manipulation as well because of some of the language and syntax around some of those functions. Mm -hmm. All right. And now let's get into a little bit on visualization. Uh, we, we don't have a, a ton of time to do this. We also don't have that many examples. Um, and we picked some fairly complex examples to show you how quickly you can build something that, that, is, that is real. In, in this, uh, I think the balance is getting closer all of the time. On the R side, the number one package is going to be ggplot, or technically ggplot2, which is going to give you the ability to connect to data, to have a variety of different functions you can run on that data to show you some of these options. And I think um, both of these tools, you see the link here and here, if I go to this one, R Graph Gallery, these sites are amazing. So if you are interested in, in what you want to build, you essentially just come here, say, oh, I want to build a bubble chart. You look at an advertisement, you close the advertisement, um, and you can go in and just see all of these things that you can make in ggplot. And if you like it, you pick on it, and it's going to give you all of the code to make it. So it's a fantastic way to start off. That, that one is for R. There's also another one for Python, which will give you the exact same type of setup. And it's going to use these packages primarily. So on ggplot2 on the uh, R side, a uh, combination of matplotlib, an extension to matplotlib with Seaborn. Um, and then for interactive graphics, Plotly um, with Python is really nice as well. So Dave is going to show us some data visualization tips back in the uh, Python notebook. Yes, so I'm using the Seaborn package here. So I imported that as SNS and I'm making what's known as a hair plot here from our auto claims data. And this is a, a great way to quickly see you know, what's going on for what are the relationships between all my numeric variables. So it creates the scatter plots for all pairs of them. And then on the diagonal, you have what's known as a density, a kernel density histogram. So you can kind of see how the data is uh, spread across. And I, I added color by large claim here, whether it's either a yes or a no. So really quick way to kind of see what's going on uh, in your data set. Um, and the one below it, I decided to make a more complicated um, example. I really love these plots. They're known as violin plots. And the rule for these basically is the wider they are, the more data points that there are in that particular region. It's more dense. Right, so it really allows you to see what's going on. So here I'm looking at monthly premiums, whether it's a large claim or not, and then also by residence type. So I can see how those monthly premiums are different for all those various combinations 
of, of customers. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, in R, you can come across and use ggplot to do similar um, approaches. Here, I'll do a very, just a quick example, trying to replicate that, that pairs plot that, that David showed. And you can see here where, again, we're splitting by different variables. It doesn't really matter what they are at this point, but for you to start seeing the differences in those specific categories. And then on the violin plot, using ggplot, which is usually ggplot, pass in your data, tell it what you want in the X and the Y, and then tell it what type of plot to show, we can see a similar violin plot here. But as you would imagine with either one of these, if you, if you start tweaking a few of the inputs, so instead of geom violin, maybe I want geom, uh, geom box plot. And if I run this, now you can see we've switched it to a different visualization. So there's so many ways that you can customize this. And if this was three years ago, I would have said R wins data visualization by a long shot. Yeah. Um, increasingly, I think they're more balanced. There's actually packages within Python where you can do ggplot uh, called plot nine, I believe it is called. Plotly, like you see down here, that does interactive. It can make some really nice visualizations um, as well. The reason why I'm giving R the edge on data visualization and reporting is actually because of the reporting side of that. And we don't have time to get into it today, but there's, th there's this package called R Markdown. And within R Markdown, you can make incredible PDFs, HTML documents, Word documents. You can do it very easily. Uh, David and I actually have a product we, that we have running for a client that we get out new data every day. We build this HTML report. We push it onto their server for their, for their clients to, to review. Um, so you can do a lot with R Markdown, which is why I'm giving it a slight edge in this category still to, to R. We don't have any examples for natural language processing, but we wanted to show you some of the main libraries for each one. On Python, I think NLT, NLTK is probably the, the, the standard one that people are starting with, but now Spacey has some really advanced functionality uh, there as well for you to help parse you know, massive text data from tweets or from books or whatever you might have. Um, but I love, if you, if you are going the R route, uh, there's a package called Tidy Text, and this textbook, Text Mining with R, is relatively straightforward. Um, and it gives you great examples to walk through connecting to text data, teasing out ways for us to start analyzing it, and then building up basic visualizations. I think in terms of raw power, though, uh, I think Python probably wins this one as well. Yes, yeah. And they have many more uh, methods that are available or models uh, for text uh, mining. Yeah. And now we get into the fun stuff, for David, at least. <laughs> uh, yes. David, what, what is your vibe on big data, machine learning, and ML ops between these two tools? Yeah, so uh, Python definitely has the edge on this one. It, it's great for working with massive data sets. So if, if anyone has heard of the tool Spark before, uh, there's a connector in Python known as PySpark, where if you have, just think massive, you have billions of rows um, in your data. So you can't work with that on your computer anymore. And so the theory behind this is, well, what if I split that up into maybe 10 million teeny little data sets and just distribute them across multiple computers? And then I do computation on each one and put them together um, in the end. So that's really how all this, this big data technology works. But uh, Python has many options. There's PySpark. There's something known as Dask, uh, which will do that. There's something known as Azure Synapse that Microsoft is offering its uh, Python product as well. So these are all great tools, and um, especially for uh, the ML ops side. You have things such as Airflow, which helps you do your data engineering, and then maybe put in a model that you want to execute in a particular step and pump that out, you know, onto a website. So it's a very developed ecosystem, and most of the developments in big data, uh, from my experience, come out in the Python community first, and then they make their way into R. R Studio likes to incorporate them, but that's usually in later, and they're not supported as well. Yeah, why don't we, we, we have some machine learning code examples for you. Why don't we pass on those so we can get through the rest of these categories for tonight? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but it, it'll come out to you when we send out an email with the code. Uh, similarly, on the web development and software engineering side, Python here is, is kind of, I, I think, still the, the clear winner. Although I, I mentioned we run production products within the R ecosystem for paying clients. So you, you can do it. Um, but the, the amount that we built our website recently on, on Python uh, with, through, through the Django library 
anything that you're doing that is close to web or software engineering, you know, Python really seems to be the, the standard for getting involved in those products and projects. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, one of the last things to talk through is community. And again, I think this, I think a couple of years ago, I would have said our studio win or our wins this because of our studio. Our studio is this fantastic organization that has brought together people who really care about data science um, into both their, their product, their, their, their tool that we've been showing you tonight, uh, but through a variety of conferences and events throughout the year. Um, but the overall size of the Python community is definitely much larger. So you've got people yes. that don't do any data science, but they know information about Python to help you get through your um, projects. Also, um, things like Kaggle um, with, with machine learning and the data science community and the competitions. Mm -hmm. It's like Python is the default language to start out with in a lot of these very popular um, platforms for working with data today. Um, I still say at this point in time in 2022 is probably a draw. You're going to find great people, great projects on, on both sides of the aisle. Um, yeah. But either way you go, you're going to find support if you need it. And that support might be static through something like Stack Overflow, or maybe through these the, 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 any number of events that are hosted throughout the year. So the verdict on all of this, we put all of them together. Uh, we saw a couple of draws. If you go by purely these components we're looking at, these arbitrary ones in some way, and there are more that we didn't have time to discuss tonight, we have Python winning this six to five. But you can probably tell through our commentary that there's a lot to, to be had on both sides in terms of what you're working on. And the reality is, the key takeaway is, regardless of, of what tools are available or the most popular ones that are out there, what are you doing today? What do you think you're going to be working on tomorrow? And in what environment do you want to do this? I mean, do you want to go work in Silicon Valley at a tech startup? Do you want to go work um, in a higher education organization or in healthcare? I mean, th th these considerations matter both in terms of the actual product, the R or the Python, which can mostly do the same thing as the other one right now, but the communities around this can be slightly different. The real point is picking one because we, we completely endorse learning how to code, moving from spreadsheets into R or to Python, and then once you can code, being able to jump between R or Python, because at some point you're going to say, oh, this actually is better in R, or this is better in, in Python. And thankfully today, the, the pure amount of resources that are out there right now, um, I'll, I'll leave a, a link to, to our site where you can get all of the data science courses you can probably wrap your head around um, in the world. And we just launched a new um, site today, or a new part of our site today, but we've got more than 2,000 data science courses up here. Let's say you're interested in Python, you know, type in Python. You're going to find right off the bat, you're going to have 372 results. You know, maybe you want to, I only want beginner ones. That's going to drop you down to 85. But we can see how this balances out, not just like in an online course, like a Coursera or an edX, uh, but maybe a cheat sheet. And if I go to an advanced filter, you know, maybe I'm really picky about who I want to learn from. So of all of the ones available, you know, I'll go through, I really want to go to Harvard University. So I'm going to get out of here and we can see, wow, you know, I've narrowed now, now down. I want a beginner course in Python. This happens to be free through edX. Um, and it's a great course actually from CS50 in terms of introduction to AI with Python. So there's so many ways that you can get involved and learn today. I encourage you to check out these sites. Uh, we will follow up with, with each and every one of you um, in, in the coming weeks, just sending out all the code from what we looked at today. We'll send you a markdown file, both from Python and from R. And then when you get involved and you start using either the cloud versions that are out there or trying to get it set up on your desktop, you'll have some code to start working with um, at first. But I, I definitely wish you well on, on your journey. David and I are, are excited for you. Uh, because it's a lot of fun uh, to work in this field right now. And you can point your skill set to anything that you might be interested in and find a way to add value. Yes. Okay. So thanks for me. David, any, any final words from you? No, yeah. Thanks, thanks for uh, joining us today. And data, just being in data is great. I mean, I can't stress enough about how much I love my job and love working with data, just in math and things like that. And I get to do it 
in my job. And I think that's just incredible. And I think all these free courses that are online on our site now, I, I wish we had this 10 years ago yeah. because it would have just sped things up a lot. The world has changed for the better, I think. Now anybody can learn these skills and just kind of break into the industry. Yeah, very well said. Thank you, David, for your time. Thank you for everyone for attending. We really appreciate the, the, the support. Write us with questions. You can reach me at alex at dataquery.com or david at dataquery.com. And we're happy to take uh, any questions you might have as you continue on your learning journey. Thanks so much. And we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.